Hi, my name is Ali Shesova and welcome to this uh, Breacher Digital uh, ST Digital PFC Design webinar using STM32. Um, uh, throughout the next hour or so, uh, we're going to talk about why we need power factor correction or PFC. And then we're going to look at PFC operation at the block level. And then we talk about each main building block, uh, power stage, voltage loop, current loop, uh, voltage, feed forward, uh, and so on. Uh, and then we look at the digital implementation of uh, um, our PFC. Uh, and then we will do a complete design using uh, Breach's uh, PLD design software. This is available free for all uh, SD customers. Uh, and uh, this software effectively designs almost everything for you, including the sizing of the power stage components and the uh, control loop coefficients in digital domain. And then finally, my colleague and friend, Dr. Michael Holworth, is going to show you some fantastic demonstrations and some experimental results on how we get everything working on the setup that we actually use in our uh, digital power and digital PFC workshops with ST. So, why do we need power factor correction? Uh, basically because nonlinear loads draw nonlinear currents, and you'll see shortly that this will cause an enormous amount of problems. Now, unfortunately, almost all power electronic power converters fall in this category, and that will result in large harmonic currents. Um, and a poor power factor is only a byproduct of these harmonics that we are effectively injecting into our system. Um, so, non -solar, solar current drawn by these nonlinear loads have many disadvantages. They result in the deformation of the voltage waveform. So, those of you who have looked at the mains voltage uh, waveform, you will see that it's actually rarely a sinusoid. Many times it's quite cropped top, triangular shape, and that is because of all these harmonics that our various products are injecting on the line. And uh, um, they result in higher I squared R losses on the utility side of the grid. That is before the meter. And that means that the power company cannot charge for it. And of course, they're not terribly happy about this. They charge in larger RMS currents. And that means that they need to install thicker conductors. Certain harmonics, such as triplet harmonics, can go down the neutral line and can be quite hazardous. So in order to make sure that we don't face these uh, disadvantages, there are international regulations such as EN uh, 61003-2 from, let's say, European Union that prohibit us from drawing too much non-sinusoidal current. And power factor correction is just a way that we use, it's a method that we use in order to make sure that our current that we draw is not peaky and full of harmonics, but instead it's sinusoidal like a resistor. So if you consider our system, we'll look something like this. Now, we have um, our mains voltage, 230 volts. Uh, first, we rectify it using a bridge rectifier, and you see this rectify sine wave over here. And then we put it in a, in a whole bunch of bulk capacitors, or DC link capacitors, and we end up with a loosely, well, hardly regulated uh, um, DC link voltage, like so. It's a DC voltage. At the moment, actually, there's no regulation, and then, and then you have your appliance. Now, if this appliance was just a resistor, if it was just um, a heater, for example, would we still need power factor correction? And the answer is yes, we would, uh, because the problem is not with this load being resistive. The problem is over here, the way we rectify our sine wave, and then we store the charge in, into this capacitor. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. I have got the setup here. I've got a bridge rectifier. I've got a capacitor, and I've got a resistive load here. Now, the green line is the capacitor voltage, and the red line is a line voltage. So the red line is here, and the green line is here. And you can see that as long as the red line, the voltage on the line, is lower than the capacitor voltage, right? the current is coming out of the capacitor and is feeding our load. Okay? that no current can go this way because the potential across the capacitor is bigger than the potential of this line. You see the green line is higher than the red line. Now, during this period from there for from there to here, the capacitor is feeding the resistor. When the capacitor is feeding the resistor, it's getting discharged. And you can see that because the green line is coming down. This is the capacitor voltage going down as we feed our resistor. Now, what happens then is that at exactly this point here, 
the line voltage, the red line, goes above the capacitor voltage. At that point, you have got massive current flowing down here from the line down to here in order to recharge the capacitor. You can see that the capacitor recharges and follows the shape of the line voltage. But more importantly, look at what happens to the current. A massive burst of current from there to there starts flowing into the capacitor to replenish it of the energy that it has been supplying the load. And this is the bit that is a problem. Okay. So let us look at this in a little bit more detail. Here I've got my line voltage rectified, right? In an ideal world, if we just had a resistor without the bridge rectifiers and without the capacitor, a resistor would take a sinusoidal current like so. And we know that power is voltage times the current. And therefore, you can see that we deliver power during this entire period, okay? So this is for a pure resistor, that's your line voltage. That is a line current with a pure resistor, okay? And we take this much time to deliver a certain amount of power. Now, because of the action of the bridge rectifier and the capacitor, just like we saw, because we only use this period here to deliver the same amount of current, what happens is that during this period and this period, we have to deliver exactly the same amount of power that we delivered during this entire cycle. And therefore, the current has to be much bigger because we're only using a short period of the cycle to actually feed our capacitor. And of course, that is a problem. If the current flowing into the capacitor is this high, instead of a resistive load, which would look like so, then the conductors have to take into account that the peak of the current is higher, the RMS of the current is higher, these sharp edges have got much more harmonics, which we know that we have got some problems with. And that is why we need power factor correction. So effectively, all a power factor corrector does is that it forces us to draw a current during the entire cycle like a resistor, as opposed to let the current go wild and go massively high, like so. Okay? So, here is a real example of a real measurement. Uh, here, I have got my voltage, and here you can clearly see the current that is flowing into the capacitor, and it's only, it's only taking this long in order to charge the capacitor so that we can deliver the power over the entire cycle. So, how does active power uh, factor corrector operate? Well, you first place a PFC stage between the diode bridge and the bulk capacitor. We actually then can reduce the size of this bulk capacitor quite significantly. And then we put a diode steam converter afterwards. So our buck converter, flyback converter, whatever it is, uh, will then convert that. Note that the output of this will be around 400 volts in case of an active PFC but it's poorly regulated in terms of the voltage. So this is not a stiff, hard, poor, four, 400, uh, big about a 400 volt DC link, right? This is quite badly regulated, but we don't care because the job of the power factor corrector is not to regulate the voltage. The job of the power factor corrector is to make sure that the current over here is a sinusoid. The job of the downstream converter is to regulate the voltage. So, so when we place our downstream converter, this will provide us with a stiff, well-regulated voltage, which our load requires. Okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to note that the job of the PFC is not to control the voltage. Its job is to control the current. Okay? Okay, so you get poorly regulated distorted voltage over here, but beautiful sinusoidal current over here, just like a resistor, and then you get clean, regulated, isolated voltage over there. Now, the most common topology that we use um, for uh, PFC is uh, the boost topology, and in this webinar, we're going to talk about continuous conduction mode boost topology. It is suitable for PFC applications because we can operate over the entire universal voltage rate, so we can go um, from 85 volts, which is the lowest voltage that we expect to get in the world um, in an AC line, uh, to 265 volts, which is the highest one that we expect to get. 
Now, input current is not switched. As you can see, that's a good advantage because the switch is here. Input current has got a massive inductor on it. And of course, we know that inductors don't like big changes in current. So the fact that we have got an inductor here it actually helps us. The switch is on the low side. <clears throat> so um, the voltage across the switch is not uh, too high. Uh, and we need a cheap gate drive. Uh, and therefore, um, it's a quite a suitable uh, topology. Um, in the boost inductor, the input current is the same as the, um, the inductor current. And that means that if I change the duty of this, I can control the current. So if I change the duty of this, I can control the input current. And that means that I can control this in order to force the input current to be sinusoidal. So by varying the duty, we shape the input current into what we want. And of course, in order to do that, we need some control loops. So effectively, what we're doing is we are putting a rectified uh, sine wave, that's our voltage, across the input of our boost converter. Then we control the duty of this, like so, in a kind of a sinusoidal manner. Right? And as we do that, we force the shape of the current to be sinusoidal, and that makes it look like a resistor. And you can see, if you actually zoom in, you're turning a switch on, turning a switch off, turning a switch on, turning a switch off, and by varying the duty, you force it to go up and down. For now, let us ignore the voltage loop. So for now, let's say that we are not controlling the uh, um, output voltage at all. Therefore, we are free to do what we want with this switch. And all we do, we don't care what's happening here for now, all we do is we vary this in order to ensure that this is in phase and same shape as that. Effectively, it makes the whole thing look like a resistor. Okay, So we have got a current loop, therefore, in order to shape the current. And later on, we talk about the voltage loop because we don't want the voltage to be completely uncontrolled. We want to have some control on it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So for now, if we just talk about the current loop. We need to generate a demand duty, and we do that from the input voltage. We want our demand current that goes into the current loop control to be the same shape. So what we do typically is we take a potential divider, we take this rectified sine wave, and we say to the control loop, you know what, I want my current to be exactly the same shape as this rectified sine wave. So that goes into the control loop. Then we measure our current. Right. So this is the current shape that we want. This is the current shape that we're getting. We compare these two together, and that gives us the error signal. That gives, that gives me the difference between the current that I want and the current that I'm getting. And then that goes into a uh, compensator. Now, in analog, that is typically just a type 2 um, compensator. In digital, that becomes a two-pole to zero. We have discussed this in one of our previous videos. And of course, PLD will calculate everything for you. Now, for now, all you need is the fact that this is a compensator that is going to compensate and ensure that this actual current follows the demand current. So the current demand current, sorry, the current error goes into the PWM. The PWM turns on the switch and the switch controls the input current and there we go. Our current loop is control is closed, but we still don't have any control over the output voltage. Okay? As I mentioned earlier, the PLD will design this loop for you. And therefore, we're not going to go through the detailed design of this within this short uh, webinar. In fact, in our uh, workshops, we do discuss how you calculate everything and how you control uh, your current. So... <clears throat> We have closed the current loop, which is the inner current loop over here, and now we're going to have to close the voltage loop because, as I mentioned earlier, up until now, we've been ignoring the output voltage. We're saying, you know what? We don't care. But we do. We need to somehow have a little bit of control over it. Okay? Now, we take the output voltage, we pass it through a potential divider, and then we compare it to a reference voltage. Typically, what we ask for the output voltage to be around 400 volts, usually 375, 385 volts. So this is the voltage that I'm getting. I'll talk about these harmonics later. So this is the voltage that I'm getting. This is the voltage that I want, 400 volts. I compare it to together. So this is the error. 
And again, that goes into another uh, control loop. And this one is the voltage loop. The voltage loop takes the error signal and compensates it. We call this VA out, voltage amplifier output. Again, that is a type two compensator in analog world. Again, that becomes a two pole to zero in digital world. Again, we have had a, uh, many videos, in fact, on these and how you design them. And we discuss them in a workshop or for this short webinar. We are going to use PLD and PLD will design everything for you. Then what we will do is we will multiply this with that. So effectively, the output of this voltage loop is only scaling this demand current. Our demand current is a sinusoidal, uh, a, a rectified sine wave, and the voltage loop will just increase or decrease its amplitude. So for example, if the output suddenly starts drawing too much current, this voltage here would fall down because this is the negative feedback loop. As this will fall down, this VA out will go up. So you multiply this current by a bigger number and therefore you get bigger current. And that's exactly what we want, a negative feedback. There we go. And that is what we're doing. And we have closed both loops. So now we've got an inner current loop and an outer voltage loop. And that gives us a little bit of control over uh, the output voltage, but because the main job is to control the current, you don't want this loop to interfere the, with the performance of that. So typically, the crossover frequency of this is 10 kilohertz, very fast, uh, very quick transient response, and you cannot make this fast, because if you do, then you mess this bit up. And of course, our job is to shape the current. So th this one is extremely slow, around 7 to 10 hertz, okay? And because it's such a slow loop, you end up with having some second harmonic ripple. Now, in the uh, um, um, in Europe, second harmonic of, of 50 hertz would be 100 hertz, and in the uh, United States and uh, North America, Canada, it will be around 120 hertz. So here you've got, let's say, 50, uh, 100 hertz of ripple. Now, this causes us a problem because this is being used in order to generate the demand value of the current. And of course, if this has got second harmonic on it, we end up demanding second harmonic. And therefore, one of the jobs of this voltage loop is to attenuate this 100 hertz error signal because we don't want to add extra 100 hertz on top of this. It will, it will, it will reduce the performance of the whole thing. Okay, again, as I mentioned earlier, PLD will design the loop for you. So let's have a look at the next building block. And that is the uh, voltage feed forward filter. We have a problem with the way that we are doing this in that our demand current is being generated from the input voltage. Okay. Now, because you're trying to deliver constant power, in a normal, let's say, DC-DC converter, if the, vol if the line voltage falls down, the current has to go up in order to make sure that the amount of power that we deliver is the same, okay? However, look what happens here. If the line voltage goes down, the demand current also goes down. And that is exactly the opposite of what we want. If the line voltage goes down in a PFC, to deliver the same power, we have to force this to go up so that, again, we deliver the same amount of current. And the part of the circuitry that does this is called the voltage feed forward filter. Okay, again, in the uh, uh, workshops, we go through a lot of details of how this operates and, and, and how it actually works and how you design one. For the sake of this uh, short webinar, we just use PLD and PLD will design everything for you. So, as I mentioned earlier, ideally in our PFC, we would like the uh, input power to stay constant, but this is not the case because of the fact that the current shape is being generated from the input voltage shape. And of course, if that goes down, the current will also go down and we use the uh, voltage feed forward, uh, voltage filter, okay? Now, at block level then, we have got a boost converter. We have got some gain. Again, the, uh, you need to take into account uh, within uh, um, your uh, control loop. You have got some gain then you have rectified this. Now that goes into an ADC, okay? So we take samples of this because we need to start doing all those calculations that I told you. Now here is the sampled version. So you got sample, 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 sample. 
And then you scale that with something called KV in. Then, after you've scaled this, you end up with a constant, which is that scaling factor, and a sine wave in discrete time. So it is sample, 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 and it's following the shape of the sine. Then, this is the part that does the voltage feed forward section. So you pass it through a digital low pass filter. Again, WDS will design that for you. You multiply it by 1.1. We do that in the software. We've got all the software libraries that's, uh, that, that will do all of this for you. And then we have to square it. And that is called the voltage feed forward calculations that you have to do, right? Then we take our output voltage. Remember, we've got a control loop on the output voltage. Again, we put that through uh, an ADC. And again, this was the original continuous time version. This is the discrete time version. So we've taken sample, 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 and so on. That goes through another scaling factor. We compare what we want with what we are getting. That is the real voltage. Now it's sampled. That is the demand voltage that's inside of our code. And the difference between these two is the voltage error. As I mentioned earlier, in the analog world, we put that through a uh, analog compensator. Here now, we put it through a digital compensator, and that is a two-pole to zero compensator. PLD will calculate everything for you, all the coefficients and so on. And that gives you VA out. And remember, that was the scaling factor that just scaled the rectified sine wave for the, um, 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 uh, for the demand current. Then finally, you calculate this. So you take this value, there we go, that's here, you multiply it by VA out, right? so you scale it by VA out, right? just like we do in analog world, and then you divide it by the square of the RMS voltage. And what you have done here by low pass filtering, multiplying by 1.1 and squaring is actually you have created this input voltage squared. And this is the voltage feed forward term, okay? The output of this is the demand current I am out, okay? So now we have created something that is taking into account the shape of, the shape that we want, this rectified sine wave. We multiply it by the output of the voltage loop and we divide it by the voltage for, for feed forward filter term and that is the demand current. Now we have to measure the real current. So here we measure the real current. Again, we have got a gain term. Now this is the uh, current that we want. This is the current that we're getting. Now, if you remember, we now have a current loop. So you sample this, you scale it. This is the current that you want. This is the current that you're getting. Now they are both in discrete time in the digital domain. You subtract one from the other and that gives you the current error. And then that goes through the current loop, which is another 2 pole to zero. Again, PLD will calculate all the coefficients for you. Again, from our other videos, you know you will know exactly how these compensators work. And then you scale it again, and then finally you have got your PWM. And that is the one that we feed into the uh, switch. And therefore, uh, everything is... Uh, we've, we've closed the loop. So we've got the, closed the voltage loop, we've closed the current loop, and we have looked after voltage feed forward from filter. And this is a type of setup that we use in order to implement the, um, uh, the, the, the in, in digital domain, a digital PFC. So if for now we ignore all the scaling from previous slides, you can see that we need to design one digital voltage controller. We have, uh, and that is just a, um, um, a, a type two controller, uh, one digital current controller. Again, uh, that is the uh, um, PLD will design that for you. That's the current controller. Um, we have not designed them in analog. Uh, we do this in the workshop. Uh, the, 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 and um, for this for this case of this short seminar, we have taken them all out. And then we have designed one digital low pass filter, and that is the voltage feed forward term. So of course, a STPLD will calculate all of this for you, and this is in fact available for you um, for free from this link over here. Okay, now consider our filter in real life. Now we have uh, an absolute maximum peak voltage of 375 for universal voltage. We have scaled it down to 3.3 volts. 
Okay, so what we haven't discussed so far is all the scaling. So we took 375 and we scaled it down with a uh, potential divider. So we need the scaling factor of 1 over 114, right, here for our potential divider. So everything that we discussed, right, is off by a factor of 1 over 114, okay? And therefore, there we go, that's the gain of this potential divider. In order to put everything back, you have to anti-scale everything that you calculate. So in your code, you have to multiply by 114 to negate this over here, right? Then uh, let's look at the ADC. ADC takes a voltage from 0 to 3.3 and gives a number between 0 to 4095. So it has a scaling factor of 4095 divided by 3.3. So everything that we have done is off by this scaling factor. So, so to negate this, you have to anti-scale it by reciprocal of this, which is 3.3 divided by 4095. So 4095 divided by 3.3, in your code you multiply by 3.3 divided by 4095, the multiplication gives you 1, so the scaling becomes 1, and therefore you anti-scale it effectively. Okay, so that's the gain of the ADC, and so on. So that means that our result is wrong by this scaling factor and that scaling factor, so what you have to do is anti-scale all of these, okay? Now, let's talk about it, this scaling a little bit uh, de more detail. So we started here. We have got uh, G3, which is the scaling factor over here. And we have got a scaling factor for the ADC, which is 4095 divided by 3.3. .3. So what we have to do is anti-scale that by exactly the opposite, okay? 1 over G3 times G ADC. So, if we have a look here, what the scaling factors we have? We have one scaling factor there, one scaling factor there, one scaling factor there, one scaling factor there. Uh, where's the next one? Yeah, one scaling factor over here, one scaling factor over here, and you have one scaling factor over here. And you see that you've got a whole bunch of scaling factors. Again, we have written library functions that deals with all of these. All you have to do is know what this resistor and that resistor is. Calculate again. You put this in the library functions that are available for you, and all the scalings will be looked after for you. Okay? So, again, in the workshop, we discuss exactly how you negate all of these. But for the sake of this uh, short webinar, all you have to do is when you look at the code samples that we give you, and they're in fact named exactly the same. When you see G2, when you see G3, all you have to do is work it out and type it into the code and everything else will be calculated for you. This is some experimental results for you. Now then, um, this is the rectified input voltage, right? Um, this is the current, the blue trace is the current. The green trace is the input voltage. This is the rectified input voltage. And you can see that the current is following beautifully the, the, the voltage. Um, it's a bit noisier because we're actually switching. We're forcing it to shape like, uh, to, be, to be shaped like a sinusoid. If it were a, um, a resistor, obviously this would have been clean. And then finally, this is the output voltage at around, let's say, 400 volts. Or in, oh, this is the low voltage board, by the way. Um, uh, in our workshops, because we cannot deal with 400 volts, because it can uh, hurt the uh, attendees, we have designed this special board specifically for our workshops whereby we have divided everything by 10. So you put in 23 volts sinusoid and you take out 40 volts uh, DC. Uh, and this is the workshop that we use on our in our workshop so that you can have some real hands-on experience. You really code this, you do calculate everything, you do some uh, real measurements on this board. And there we go, here is your output voltage and you can just see that is not quite as straight, and that is because it has got that second harmonic superimposed on top of it. And then if I look at it uh, on my oscilloscope, I looked at the harmonics. These are the harmonics with the power factor switched on. You can see now that the voltage and the current are both sinusoid, 
And you can see that there, well, this is my uh, switching frequency. And after that, the harmonics fall down quite significantly. Uh, if you measure the, uh, if you decide to measure the uh, loop, uh, you should really measure both the voltage loop and the current loop. We do that using uh, Omicron's uh, uh, Body 100. We've got some great videos on how you measure the loops of um, of, of power factor correctors um, on our on our website, and this is the type of result that you'd get. Remember, I said that uh, the um, um, the, the voltage loop is usually very slow at around 6 or 7 hertz, 6 to 10 hertz. And there we go. We have here designed for 7 hertz, and we've got 60 degrees of phase margin. So it shows that the design using PLD is actually, this is a real measurement. It is giving us very good results. Okay. So uh, I am now going to switch uh, over to STPLD, and I'm going to design one step-by-step um, step, uh, all the way. And uh, after that, uh, I will pass on to Michael, who will show you the experimental results. So let's go to STPLD. Okay, so when you open up STPLD, again, you can download this directly from our website. You provide it with the, um, the voltages that you want. So the minimum voltage for universal voltage, that is usually 85 volts. Um, nominal voltage, let's say is 230 volts for the European Union. Maximum uh, voltage, let's say 275 volts. <clears throat> Frequency in the European Union, that would be 50 hertz. Uh, in North America, that would be 60 hertz. Of course, EN 61003 2 is a European Union standard, and therefore we go at 50 hertz. Let's design it for 250 watts, and let's use switching frequency of 200 kilohertz. Then the output voltage, I have been saying 400 volts is typically 375 to 385. Let's stay with 385 volts. And then hold up time is the period of time that you're going to assume that the line can go down and then come back up. And we're saying that the hold up time is 20 milliseconds. So it's one cycle. Uh, so in, within this one cycle, how low are you going to allow the output voltage to fall? Our output voltage under normal conditions is 385. After 20 milliseconds of line going down, I only allow it to go down to 335 volts. I don't want it to go down any lower. Okay, And that, of course, determines the size of the output capacitor. So by typing this number here, you... The, the software will automatically calculate the uh, output capacitors for you. And you can see here, based on what you have given it, uh, if we allow 15% ripple, um, current ripple, uh, it will allow, it will, calc it has calculated the inductance to be around 500 microhenries, so let's say 500 microhenries. And then it is take it is uh, given us 278 millifarads of capacitance, and that is based on this hold up time over here. Okay, it also gives you the stresses on the components so that uh, you know the current ripple on the capacitor and the, the, the voltages and so on, and therefore you can go and um, um, buy the correct size of the capacitor and the inductor. Then, in the case of our digital power supply, let us, use, let us say that we use a current transformer with a turns ratio of 1 to... 100, um, and then the peak return current is around 4 amps, and let us say that we are going to allow, we would like a voltage to appear on our ADC pin. This is the voltage across the burden resistor of the, of the current sense, and if our ADC is 3.3 volts, I would usually go for around 2.5 to 2.8, but for simplicity, let's say that we want 3 volts. And as soon as you type in what voltage you are going to allow on the pin of the ADC, it calculates the exact size of the burden resistor. So look at that. If I change that to 1, it says you need a burden resistor of 24. If I change that to 3, it says you need a burden resistor of 72. Um, and what this means is that at the peak of the current, the voltage that will appear on the ADC pin that is sampling the current uh, is going to be 3 volts if you solder in a 72 ohm resistor. And 
It's calculate the current gain for you. And if you remember from when I was talking about all the scaling and all the gains, current gain is one of those gains that you need. So you just go and put that in your code. It's already worked it out to be 0.721. Okay, then in the multiply section, we're going to have to tell the software how much harmonics we are going to allow. And of course, that represents whether we pass or fail. Now, the more low you make this harmonic, the lower you make this harmonic, the harder it is to design the compensator. You have to have a higher crossover frequency and so on, and it makes life more difficult. So ideally what you want to do is pick a certain amount of harmonic that just allows you to pass the test with a little bit of margin, right? 0.75 third harmonic permitted as a result of the voltage feed forward is not a bad number. Um, then it works out the voltage feed forward gain. If you remember, the voltage feed forward was a uh, low pass filter. You saw that on the block diagram. So it is taking these values and it work, works out the cutoff frequency of the filter that you need to design. Not only that, it actually works out the coefficients of this digital filter. And of course, in the sample code that we provide for you, you there's a section whereby you just need to paste these in and then you end up with a 10 hertz, um, 10 hertz low pass filter. Let's say I was going to allow one and a half percent of harmonics, third harmonic due to the voltage feed forward filter. Okay, then you can see that I can then get away with a filter with a higher crossover frequency, which is 15 hertz. Again, it has calculated the coefficients for me. All I have to do is copy to clipboard. You go to your code. Michael will demonstrate this for you, um, or at least the entire code, and you just paste in these coefficients, and there you have it. You have the voltage feed forward filter. Okay? Then let us go to voltage loop. I'm here looking at the voltage loop. I'm looking at the plant and the loop, but I only really need the loop for this demonstration. This is the loop. I have got the crossover frequency of 7 kilohertz, and I've got a phase margin of uh, 60 degrees. I've got very good gain margin and a very nice slope. Again, in our other videos, we, dis we describe what is a good body plot for a stable control loop. I've here set this to 7 hertz crossover frequency, but I can change it. Let's say if I do 10 or if I do 100, please don't go higher than 10, but you can see that as soon as I change, it will redesign everything for me. It gives me new coefficients and also gives me a warning saying, hey, your crossover frequency for the voltage loop is too high. So let's stick with 10, 60 degrees of phase margin. And with 60 degrees of phase margin, it is estimating that I'm going to end up with 3.5% of second harmonic on our output voltage. Now that might be a little bit too high. So let's, uh, let's see if we can get away with Seven, look how quickly, how it calculates it. So if I have a crossover frequency of seven hertz, I end up with 1.7% of um, harmonics on my output. 10 gives me 3.5%. Okay, if I go to stay with seven. And of course, that manifests itself on the input current as 0.85% uh, of third harmonic. And it's calculated the poles and zeros, and it has calculated the uh, coefficients. I copy this. And again, in a sample code that we give you, all you do, you paste it, and that is your voltage loop completed. Finally, current loop, as I mentioned earlier on, a current loop uh, needs to be much faster because the job of the uh, um, of the PFC is to shape the current and not control the output voltage. So this is my input current. You typically want a high crossover frequency, 10 kilohertz, 50 degrees of phase margin. Again, have a look at, oh, you need to go to frequency response of the current loop. I look at the loop only. Have a look at this. If I do 5 kilohertz, it automatically 
redraws and recalculates all the coefficients. So let's stay with 10 kilohertz. That will give you a relatively nice sine wave uh, in time domain, 50 degrees of phase margin, 200 kilohertz is my sampling frequency, which happens to be the same as my switching frequency. <clears throat> and then the way we structure our code is that there is a total delay of half a sampling interval. So if you use our code, that has to stay at uh, 0.5. If you use your own code and you've got different uh, amount of delay, uh, then uh, uh, you need to calculate. And of course, in the workshop, we go through a lot of details on how you make sure that you get this bit right. Otherwise, you may lose a lot of phase margin. And then finally, based on this data, it has calculated the uh, current loops uh, coefficients which I can go and I can paste again into my code. Again, Michael will demo the code for you. This is the coefficients of the current loop and uh, our design is effectively complete. So to summarize, uh, we discussed um, the uh, Baden box of the uh, PFC. We discussed the setup in digital. Uh, and then I, I've just now designed everything, voltage feed forward, voltage loop, current loop, and so on. Uh, and now I pass you over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Michael Holworth, who's going to put all of this into practice and show you how it will work in real life, show you the code, and actually show you the experimental setup and give you some experimental results. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, this is the end of my section, and Michael will take over from that. Okay, thanks, Ali. So in this half of the webinar, we're going to look at some experimental results using our uh, digital PFC starter kit. So this is the starter kit that we use in our workshops. It is a uh, low voltage digital PFC starter kit, um, because obviously we don't want people to hurt themselves in our workshop. So effectively what we've done is divide everything by a factor of 10. Um, so the input voltage is 24 volts AC, output voltage is 40 volts DC. Um, this is a CCM boost PFC, and there are two phases, so we can do interleaved CCM boost PFC. Obviously, you can see the resistive load here. We have a uh, roughly 16 watt load bank here, um, which you can control using the switches or using the MOSFETs. Uh, and the SD Nucleo card just plugs directly into the starter kit. So it's a complete kit that allows us to do design and development work at safe low voltages. Um, it's very useful because then you know, if you're doing some uh, development work, uh, things won't pop dramatically. Uh, so yes, that's the board we're using. Um, all we need to do now is look at how we implement the uh, digital PFC in terms of code. Uh, so what do we need to implement uh, on our digital PFC today? Well, looking at this plot diagram, we have our boost power stage here, and we're going to use the ADC to sample several points. Um, we're going to be sampling our input voltage, scaled down by a factor G3, uh, sampled by the ADC, and then that gets passed through our digital low pass filter. It gets scaled by a factor of 1.1 and then squared to give to convert from average to RMS and then RMS squared. Uh, the other uh, the input voltage is also used as our V and peak sine omega t term, so that's our to be our rectified sine wave shape, and that is so that our input current tracks our input voltage in a sinusoidal manner. Um, we also sample our output voltage, scaled down by G4, sample using the ADC. That gets compared with our reference, and the error term is passed through our 2 pole 2 zero voltage loop controller. Then these three inputs are used as inputs to our multiplier, uh, which is this block here. And the multiplier output is our demand value of current for that switching cycle. So we also sample our current, of course, and there are multiple ways of sampling the current. You can sample the return current like we're doing in this diagram, or you could sample the switch current with a some kind of current transducer in uh, the one of the legs of the, the MOSFET. So we sample the return current here, scaled by G2. Uh, that gives us our, our sample current. We compare that with our demand current, which is the output of the multiplier. 
and that gets passed through our tuple to zero current loop compensator. And then that gives us our new value of duty cycle. Uh, so you'll notice here that there are several gains. So we've got G2, G3, and G4. And then we have some blocks in our diagram. So we have this gain here, which we call KVA out. And this ensures that the demand current value is in the same units as a sampled current value. So you can see our sampled current here is GADC G2. And the output of our multiplier, our demand current, also needs to be in the same units, GADC G2. Uh, and we go through this in a lot of detail in the workshop, but effectively, we, if we multiply the output of our voltage loop by this gain, KVA out, that's what we get. Then we need to negate these gains before we uh, set our PVM, PWM, to ensure we get the correct crossover frequency of our current loop. So we do 1 over GADC G2 at the output of our current loop compensator. And in our code, we call that KI loop. So we'll look at where those are in our code shortly. Okay, so now we need to configure the uh, STM32 chip. We're using the STM32 G474 device today. And to do that, we are using STM32 CubeMX. Now, the setup is very similar to the um, setup we did in the Digital Power DCDC -DC webinar a few weeks ago. Um, so I won't go through it in, in as much detail. The only real difference is that we are sampling more channels with our ADC. In our DCDC -DC webinar, we just sample the output voltage. In this Digital PFC webinar, we're sampling, as you can see here, uh, our input voltage, our output voltage, our return current, and down here, uh, the switch current, so IQ1 and IQ2 for the two phases that we have on the interleaved boost. Um, so there are more ADC channels to configure. So we are using ADC1 to sample our input voltage and output voltage, and ADC2 to sample our currents. So let's take a look at ADC2, not currents. We're not actually using the return current in this uh, example. Um, we are just using the switch current. So we have configured injected conversion mode with two conversions. Um, first conversion, rank one, is channel three, uh, which is this one here, the, the uh, FET Q1, which is one of the phases. And then the second conversion is uh, channel 4, which is Q2, the current in the, in the other phase. OK, so we are doing a CCM boost PFC, which means that we are using average current mode control. So we need to make sure that the current that we sample is the average current. Um, so for CCM, as you can imagine, we uh, turn the switch on and the current rises, then we turn the switch off and the current falls. So if we set our ADC to sample in the middle of our on time, that will be the middle of the, the rise of our current, that will be equal to the average current for that switching cycle. So to do this, we use the high resolution timer. So we're using high res timer trigger two event to trigger the sampling of our ADC. So let's take a look at our high res timer. High res timer here, ADC triggers, and trigger two event is enabled. And there are two trigger sources, timer A compare for, timer B compare for. So timer A is used to control uh, switch Q1, so the PWM of switch Q1. And then timer B is used to control the PWM of switch Q2. So we're using the compare register on time A and B, compare register 4, to trigger the ADC to ensure that we sample in the middle of the on time. So let's take a look at time A. So time A, again, we won't go through all the configuration. We did that in the DCDC -DC webinar. Please feel free to take a look at that. Um, but effectively, let's go down to the output configuration. TA1 drives the P PWM of our switch Q1. 
the set event is compare register one, compare unit one, and the reset event is compare unit three. We also have an external event to shut down the PWM in the event of a overcurrent or um, um, pause in the debugger, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and then we said we're using compare register four, compare unit four to um, take the ADC sample. So you'll note that in the code here, we haven't actually set the compare values. Um, sorry, in, in KeepMX, we've not actually set the compare values because we're, we're going to do that in the code. We have some digital PFC library functions that manage the setup of the compare unit so that we get the, uh, the correct control um, sampling at the correct point, which we'll look at in a moment. So that's the high-risk timer. Uh, what we do now is just press generate code, and then that will open uh, our selected IDE. We're using uh, Embedded Workbench from IAR as our IDE today. Um, let's just take a look at the main.c file. So we've got some header files. Um, there's main.h, which sets up the GPIOs, defines the GPIOs. And then we have our digital power library function and our breacher PFC utility functions. We're actually combining these into a new library, digital power library, that will be released soon. So please subscribe to our website uh, for, for updates. Then we have a board specific header file. Let's take a look at this. Um, and in this board specific header file, this is where we define the games. So G3, G, sorry, G2, G3, G4 that we saw on the block diagram are defined here, as well as KVA out and KI loop. So then further down in our main.c file, we have our coefficients. So these are the coefficients that uh, Ali generated using PLD. Uh, we just copy and paste them into our code. So we have the VFF filter coefficients uh, for a voltage feed forward filter, um, our voltage loop coefficients with a crossover of 7 hertz, 50 degrees, and our current loop coefficients with a crossover of 10 kilohertz, 50 degrees. We've defined our switching frequency as 200 kilohertz and our voltage loop frequency as 6 kilohertz. And we define our desired output voltage over voltage protection level, under voltage protection level, etc. We are using a uh, data structure called that we've created called PFC data float to hold all of the variables needed to implement our digital PFC. So that will be all of the 2.20 controllers, um, the soft start, uh, the runtime variables, etc. are all stored in this data structure, which we have called, we've created an instance of called MyPFC. Um, so then we have the interrupt search routines. We'll look at them in a moment. Let's just scroll down to our main function first. Uh, so here we have in main, this is where the microcontroller jumps to at the beginning of execution. Um, we configure uh, GPIOs, ADCs, uh, comparator DACs, etc. Uh, this is all auto-generated code uh, from Cubamex. Uh, anything inside these user code begin um, tags is the code that we've inserted. So this is code that we've inserted here. Uh, we're turning off switches because on our um, starter kit here, we've got some MOSFET controlled load banks. So we just set them to zero to begin with. Uh, then we have our digital power or digital PFC library functions. So here's one of them. This configures our PFC controller. So PFC 01 config float. We pass it a pointer to our PFC structure. We pass it the switching frequency, voltage loop frequency, and the soft start time in milliseconds. Then we configure our current loop uh, using this PFC01 iLoop float init function. Again, pointer to structure, current loop coefficients, min max duty. Then we have our VFF filter init function pointed to structure and our coefficients for our VFF filter. And then we configure our voltage loop. So PFC01, VLOOP float init, pointed to structure, desired output voltage, uh, converted to ADC value using this macro, uh, 
uh, under voltage protection level converted to ADC value, over voltage protection level, voltage loop coefficients, min and max outputs for our voltage loop. Then we set our uh, set up our PWM and ADC using this uh, initialization function here, and we set the number of phases that we have. In this example, we're going to do only going to do single phase. So even though we have two phases on our board for interleaved PFC, in this particular example, we're just covering uh, single phase. So let's just take a quick look at this PFC init uh, PWM ADC function. Um, this is what we want to look at. So we mentioned in CubeMX, uh, so this is our PWM, uh, and we said that we're using compare uh, unit 1 to set the output high. So compare unit 1 here sets the output high. We're using compare unit 3 here to set the output low. And then we're going to use compare unit 4 to trigger our ADC. So this sets up the, uh, the various compare registers to achieve this. And we'll look at how we update the duty based on this uh, functionality uh, in a moment when we look at ISR. But effectively what we're doing is up-down count mode. We're, we're modulating both edges of, of our PWM. So let's look at the ISRs. So ISRs are our interrupt service routine and we have multiple ISRs in our digital PFC system. The first ISR we look at is our fast loop. So the fast loop controls our current, it runs at our switching frequency, and we're using high res timer A uh, to implement our current loop. So high res timer A interrupt will occur um, every switching cycle, so at 200 kilohertz. We first thing we do is set a pin high so we can record on our scope when we enter the ISR. We clear our interrupt flag and then we, then we read the value of our current. And we store that in our um, uh, MyPFC structure. Then we run our current loop controller, so PFC01 iLoop float. Pass it the pointer to the structure and which phase we want to run. So in this case we're running phase 0 because there is only one phase. That will execute the 2 to 0 controller and give us our new value of duty. So now we read that, so my PFC, I loop 2 to 0, which phase 0, dot uh, m out gets the value of duty from our PFC structure and then we divide it by 2. Why do we divide it by 2? Well, as we saw a few moments ago, we're modulating both the trailing and leading edge of our PWM uh, using an up-down count mode effectively. So we need to split our duty between the trailing and leading edges. Um, we then end that with this duty mask. And that's exactly what it, what it says. It's a mask. So if this was all zero, then obviously the duty would be zero. Uh, the, the mask is set to zero in the case of a fault. So over voltage, under voltage, or uh, some other fault condition, the mask would be set to zero. And that would shut down our boost power stage. So then we update the compare registers using this macro here. Let's just take a look at this. And we said that we're using compare unit 1 to set the rising edge and compare unit 3 to set the falling edge. So all centered around the uh, center of our switching cycle. So I loop ticks is our switching period. Divided by 2 is the middle of our switching period, minus the uh, compared, the duty value, divided by 2, uh, would be the rising edge, and then middle of period plus duty divided by 2 would be the falling edge here. And that means that we can always sample at the middle of our cycle to achieve our average current. Then we set the ISR pin low to mark the end of our uh, ISR. The next ISR we want to look at is the slow loop. So the slow loop runs at 6 kilohertz and in STM cube MX we set up timer D uh, to run at 6 kilohertz. So again we set a pin high so we can measure the duration, check it's running, we clear a flag, 
We read our input voltage, we read our output voltage, store those in our structure. Uh, we have a PFC waveform record function here, which we use in our workshop to uh, display the variables uh, in, in the IDE, uh, effectively on a scope. We'll look at that uh, here though. Uh, then we set the soft start, whether it's soft starting or soft stopping. And then we run our voltage loop. So PFC0 on VLOOP executes all of the, the voltage loop. So let's just take a look at this. So PFC0 on VLOOP. Inside this function, we run the voltage shoot forward filter. We get our V in RMS squared value. We execute the voltage loop, the 2.20 voltage loop. Then we calculate our multiplier scaling factor. Then we check for over voltage, we check for under voltage, uh, and then we update the soft start accordingly. And we also update our duty mask, etc. So it's all contained within that one function. And finally, we just set the output pin low uh, so that we can measure the duration. Good. OK, so let's just run the code and uh, test. So we are just programming the device. Yep. So we're up and running. And now we need to uh, turn on AC. So to do this, we are several uh, several ways you can do this. So you could use a AC source if you have one. Uh, obviously set it to 24 volts. Uh, uh, for the low voltage board, um, or if you don't have an AC source, you can get 230, 220 volt to 24 volt AC adapters, or in the US, 120 to 24 volt AC adapters. There's actually quite a few 24 volt AC devices out there, like CCTV cameras and um, doorbells, etc., Christmas lights, so they're actually quite readily available. Uh, but if you have an AC source, you can use this as well. So this uh, AC source has been set to 24 volts, uh, 0 DC, and let's measure the power factor. Uh, yes, so let's turn that on. Okay, and we just need to turn on the probes and set the time base. Okay, so we have on the screen here, uh, our input voltage is channel 3, so 24 volt AC input voltage, and the let's change it trigger. Uh, yellow trace channel 1 is the scaled down and rectified input voltage. So now we just need to turn on our board and run our code. So first we'll turn on the board and this is without PFC running. So PFC is not running. Um, so what we see now is a peaky waveform rich in harmonics, which is what we don't want, which is what we're trying to avoid. This is the typical waveform that you see when you have a bridge rectifier followed by some bulk capacitance. So the bulk capacitance is being charged towards the crest of the input voltage sine wave when the uh, bridge rectifier is, is conducting. We have the output voltage on channel 4. Um, the boost PFC is not running at the moment, so we're getting 20 volts per division, so roughly 30 volts uh, on, on the output. So now we can run our code and see what happens. So I'm just going to press run here, go back to the scope, and then uh, PFC is running, so I'll just turn on some load. And you can see our input current, uh, channel 2, is now a very nice sinusoid in phase with the input voltage, um, with, from the looks of it, very, very few harmonics other than the fundamental. So that's good. Our output voltage, channel 4, is 40 volts, uh, which is what we want. And let's just change the load to see if our voltage loop is working. So input current drops. Output voltage is still 40 volts, so our voltage loop is doing what it should do. And at very low load, uh, we're in DCM for part of the cycle, so this uh, notch here is when we're going from DCM to CCM. As we increase the load, then the waveform 
gets much better. So we're at full load at the moment. Um, let's look at our power factor. So let me move this here. We have the power factor reading here from our AC source, and we're getting effectively one power factor of one, which is what we want. That means there's very uh, few harmonics. Um, the blue button on the nuclear board has been programmed to disable the PFC. So let's just press the blue button and see what happens. So our input current is now very peaky, rich in harmonics, and our power factor has reduced to 0.7. So the PFC is definitely doing its job, uh, getting good power factor and few harmonics. So that's good. Release the blue button and PFC comes back. We go back to a power factor of one. Okay, so let's analyze this in a bit more detail. We can use the uh, nice features of our Siglent oscilloscope uh, to look at the harmonics. So if we um, turn on the math function, F1 here, uh, we want to do an FFT on channel two, and we need to just change the time base a bit. Yeah, let's do that, and we'll change the horizontal. So we start at, um, let's say, 1 hertz, and then we end at, let's say, 1 kilohertz. We can then um, turn on uh, the table to look at our harmonic peaks. So this is 1 hertz, so this is 50 hertz, our fundamental, and then that will be 100 hertz, and then this uh, mark 2 here will be our um, third harmonic, 150 hertz. And we're getting uh, about minus 55, 56. Um, Oh, sorry, I think the, the, uh, the, the markers are moving. <laughs> uh, so at the moment it's the third harmonic, the, the third harmonic, this one here, minus 34. Yeah, two and three are switching, so minus 33. Okay, so let's just see what happens to this harmonic here, 150 hertz, third harmonic, uh, when we disable PFC. So let's disable the PFC. Whoa, all the harmonics shoot up. Uh, and this one here is now minus 8 dB. So we've gone from minus 33 to minus 8, so that's 25 dB a difference. That's a significant difference. Um, so you can see, obviously, that our PFC is doing its job. If I release this blue button, all of the harmonics will reduce. And we get a moment to update. There we go. And this harmonic, the third harmonic, has reduced to minus 34, 33 dB there. Um, so a difference of 25 dB, so a significant difference there. Good, so our, so our PFC appears to be working, reducing the harmonics. Um, you could then compare these against the standard 61000-3-2, um, depending on which class device you're using, uh, and check that you pass the limits. Uh, I'm, I've tested this with the power analyzer, so uh, I know this uh, passes uh, very well, um, but you can also use your scopes FFT function to do that for you. Good. Okay, so let's now just take a look at our uh, switching frequency. So I'll disable the FFT. I'll bring in the um, time base. So we have our this is obviously at um, 5 milliseconds per division, so we see our 100 hertz uh, rectified input voltage, or 50 hertz input voltage, um, and 50 hertz current there. Uh, but obviously our, our switching frequency is much higher than this. We're switching at 200 kilohertz. Um, so what we can do is just move some probes. So I'm going to just remove the uh, input voltage um, and connect the switch current probe um, uh, 
you can see the switch current is uh, sinusoidal. That's good. That's what we want. Um, and then I'm going to move the uh, scaled input voltage to the PWM. And change the trigger. Now, if I just go to something close to the so five microseconds per division, uh, obviously 200 kilohertz is our switching frequency. So you can see that our PWM is changing sinusoidally, as you'd expect, to give us that sinusoidal input current. Um, so I'm just going to use a single trigger. Uh, and there we go, we see the uh, PWM at 200 kilohertz, because we're five microseconds per division, uh, and the switch current, you can see there, a nice uh, ramp on a step in CCM, and we're taking our sample in the middle of the on time, so it's nice and clean, there's no, there's no spikes there. So that's good. Um, the other signal we want to look at is our voltage loop. Our voltage loop, we said, is, much, is running much slower, six kilohertz, so I'm going to run this and move the probe to uh, the test pin VLOOP. So VLOOP is um, the, let me show you in the code, is the pin we set high here, VLOOP ISR, we set that high when we enter the slow loop and then we set it low when we leave the slow loop. So this is what we see. Um, it's uh, it, it takes uh, takes a, a few microseconds to execute the slow loop because there's several two pole to zero controllers in there. There's lots of conditional if statements, checking under voltage, over voltage, etc. But we don't particularly care because it only uh, occurs once every six microseconds. So once every six kilohertz. Um, but let's just check the frequency. Make sure we're running at six kilohertz. So we use our cursors here, and we bring this across and. Yeah, we are running at 6 kilohertz, that's good. And one thing to note is that the duration of our slow loop ISR changes. So it's you can see the trailing edge here moving. Uh, and that's because the slow loop ISR is a lower priority than the fast loop ISR. We set that up in uh, CubeMX. Um, and that means that the slow loop will be interrupted several times, many times in fact, uh, during its execution cycle. And the microcontroller will jump from the slow loop, lower priority, into the fast loop to control the current. Uh, and then when the current loop ISR has finished execution, it will return back into the slow loop to finish doing what it was doing. So that means that the execution time will vary plus or minus some amount. Um, but again, that's fine because we still are executing our slow loop every six kilohertz. Good. So as you can see here, we have um, a nice running PFC. Um, we are have a good power factor. Um, power factor of one. We have low harmonics. Uh, the voltage is well regulated uh, using the voltage loop. Um, and effectively, we have a very well-designed PFC. We don't have time to measure the uh, the control loops. Uh, there are some other uh, of our videos on YouTube about measuring the voltage loop and current loop. There's a few uh, interesting points you have to take note of when you measure the voltage loop and current loop for a PFC. So please feel free to take a look at those videos. Um, uh, as you can appreciate, there's a lot of information around digital PFC. We've only shown you uh, an introduction. Uh, we spend days, three days in our workshop, uh, going through all this information and showing you how to design digital PFC. So if you get the chance, uh, please do come along to our workshops when we run them again, hopefully next year, um, and we'll go through this in much, much more detail. Uh, all that uh, remains for me to say is thank you very much for watching. Uh, we hope to see you at one of our workshops in the future. Please visit our website to find more of these resources available for you to download. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much and see you again soon. Thank you.